Hello, everyone. I'm so excited to introduce you to Liz Frank today. We were just talking, the exciting thing about how we've just met, Liz, is that I was writing one of our Mindful Mondays and you responded and we've been just instantly connected about your background, your story. And I thought I must share your background with our community because you have something special to talk about. Specifically today, we're going to talk about why you think through the research that you've done that schools need mindfulness. Not only mindfulness, but also specifically mindfulness teachers. So before we get dive into that juicy stuff, tell us a little bit about your background. Get us up to speed with where, who you are, where you've come from, and how, how did you get to do this work today? Yes, thank you, Giselle. I'm really excited and honored to be here and for you giving me this platform to talk about it because it's something I'm so passionate about and... Um, yeah, I'm just excited to send it out to the ears that maybe want to hear me talking about it. So yes. I've been in early childhood since 2010 um, in my local school district. I kind of did some various roles. I helped, um, you know, facilitate and certify an outdoor nature classroom there. Mm -hmm. I worked in preschool. I worked in ECFE with families. So I kind of um, got a lot of different experience in that. And then about 2016, uh, my district did our first yoga calm training, which was our social emotional learning um, from Oregon is where it originated from. They also um, yeah. were housed in Minneapolis, which is now um, she's Kathy Flamino's branched off to move mindfully. So if you've heard of either of those mm -hmm. names, that's where I've gotten my training and the light bulb went off, the flame was ignited. And I knew this is what I want to teach little children. You know, I think as an adult, I was trying to figure all this out, this stuff out myself. And um, I wish I had them at a much mm -hmm. younger age. So it's just a really deep passion of mine to get these tools um, into children at a very early age. So I followed the training. I went beyond and got certified myself. And then um, through that, I became a mindful mentor for my school district. So that meant I was helping bring, I was like a support resource officer for mindfulness in our district. So mm -hmm. I would visit classrooms and help teachers you know, kind of how to lead a circle mindfully or how to bring mindfulness tools in. I would help with behavior children. I would provide visuals that they might need. Um, I taught family nights. I taught parent ed um, classes and just did everything on my, you know, training and passion for mindfulness. So then the pandemic came uh, well, I, and I, I'll say I was hitting some obstacles because I didn't have my degree. So January of 2020, I thought, fine, I'll get my degree signed up for college at St. Kate's. And then the pandemic came Four kids, distance learning. Uh, it was crazy. I held on as long as I could. Um, and then I left my job in February of 2021, just kind mm -hmm. of took a year off. I used to, mentioned that in your emails too. a lot of people taking a break and just breathing. So that's what I did. And a year later, I realized as I was working towards getting my teaching license that um, I didn't want to teach anymore. I don't want to teach academics. That isn't where my heart is. I really missed teaching mindfulness. So summer of 2022, I started my own mindfulness business. And now I visit preschools and daycares and homeschool communities and teach mindfulness to kids. Um, and meanwhile, I've done uh, for my schooling a research paper on how to bring mindfulness um, more effectively into schools. Oh, which is perfect. I want to dive into that. Mm -hmm. I just want to highlight too, what you're talking about is this mindful mentor. Yeah. Like imagine, so, you know, kudos to your, the school for hiring or having that position, but imagine if, like, if you were, you know, had a magic wand, Liz, right? Imagine if every school had a mindfulness movement or mentor, some such, right? We're yes. hearing it more and more, definitely with our school yoga program, but just that in itself. And that helped you 
I love your story because you started with ed education. You had your early childhood experience, but then you saw what's my passion? What do I want to spend the rest of my life doing? And you had the courage to to try it out and then just and know when to step away and take that time out and get some further education and then create your own business. Like you just sort of say it so so casually. But yeah. like what you've created there is amazing, you know, and so many people in our community are right there with all these thoughts of like, imagine if I could maybe leave my position or start a new one or start, you know, a mindfulness program as well as my teaching career, you know, all of it. So exactly what you're talking about is exactly where so many people in our community are. And I so hope for those of you listening, have the courage that Liz had and know what it is that is in your heart and how you can best serve the children. Because if we're, imagine also, if we were all in positions that we loved, that every single day, that was one thing I, I thought as a teacher, the day I wake up and I don't want to be there, it's time for me to find a different role or position or whatever. It's not a job you can come into and sort of not really love it 100%, right? Yeah, to absolutely. give it your all, to give it your passion. So I just want to say that, highlight that. So let's dive into your research because this is fascinating. That's the research area, Liz, as you know, as I'm sure when you were doing your paper, it's still in its infancy with, with yeah. yoga and mindfulness to children. There's certainly a lot more research papers coming out for adults with yoga and mindfulness, but really in the beginning pieces of children. And so you've contributed to that body of work, which is amazing. Okay, so take us through what you what you found, take us through the study. Yeah. And I mean, I think I, our audience knows, like, I don't have to sell mindfulness. Mindfulness is the research research shows it is so effective. It's very useful. We, we can predict, um, it predicts lifelong success, you know, from an early attention span, executive fun function skills, um, self-regulation skills, those predict reading, writing, and math um, scores later in life and, you know, college attendance or life success later on this, there's so much correlation there. So hopefully starting there, we know, um, mindfulness-based interventions are effective and they're worth doing. Mm -hmm. Um, where we're struggling, I think is how to do it. Okay. Yeah. Right. I, I think back when I've always been an advocate or anybody who knows me knows I'm the one who's going to raise my hand and be like, this isn't working. You know, um, I don't care if the meeting runs late. I want to get to a solution. So that's me. When my district first came out with their, we call it Alice training. It's a lockdown drill, you know, the alert yeah. lockdown inform counter evacuate. Um, we just did a mandated training from our early childhood, which were have babies up to the high school level. We were practicing live shooter drills with toddlers. Mm -hmm. It was like, this is not okay. Mm -hmm. I understand that lockdown down drills are part of our reality and they're important. And we, it's better to go through emotion. Just it's practicing being safe, right? Mm -hmm. we do fire drills. We do tornado drills. And now in our world, we have to do lockdown drills. I'm okay with that. But how we implement it is really important. You can't do the same thing or procedure training and have the same language for toddlers that you're using with high schoolers, you know? So that's an example of where I wrote my superintendent and said, we got to change it. And the same thing with mindfulness. When I was doing my research, I realized there, um, it really is, like you said, it's in the early stage. We know it's great. And yes, I think we should run with it. Um, but there's, there's an issue with doing that, you know, um, we're in the, um, implementation stage, not in the standardization stage. I think somewhere in my paper, I mentioned the national center for complementary and integrative health, um, says that, uh, mindfulness-based interventions are in stage two intervention development, refinement and standardization and stage six is dissemination and implementation. So when you look at the research, we still have a ways to go before we can, we're in a place where we're mandating a protocol in school. So yeah, just that to say, yes, we still need to 
the needs are high, you know, social emotional needs for staff and students are exasperated. We need support in our schools right now. So yes, do we bring in the training? Yes. Do we talk about it? Yes. Of course I'm all over that. Um, but how are we doing it? You know, uh, teacher burnout is at an all time high. I'm sure anybody who knows an educator knows this. Uh, I'm from Minnesota the 2023 biennial report, Supply and Demand of Teachers in Minnesota, uh, stated that one third of new teachers leave the field within the first five years of teaching. That's a yeah. problem. And now the 2018-19 cohort was leaving by year three. And I'm one of the statistics. Yeah. I'm in, in the middle of getting my, I'm supposed to be student teaching this year. I've switched my degree to holistic health instead of getting my teaching license. Yeah. Um, so there's a problem. We are burnt out. Uh, there, there's a reason teachers are leaving. Um, needs are not being met. It's not because we don't care about kids. That's my my whole life's passion. I know has always been early childhood. I want to work with kids. I want to help kids. I want to give them tools. Um, I just realized the school system wasn't the fit for me anymore, or wasn't. Um, it wasn't enabling me to do what I saw was needed, you know, so yeah. that it's the conflict. So um, the other issue, um, there's a lot of trauma. We need a lot more trauma awareness, um, you know, a lot of trauma training so that teachers know how to deal with a variety of situations. And then racial and political divisiveness is, mm -hmm. you know, I hate to bring it up, but it is such an issue and now we've politicized social emotional learning. Uh, oh my gosh, right? Yeah. I, all the school boards are blowing up because the parents don't want, you know, social emotional learning. They hear this word and it's a trigger word now for politics. And that just can't be. We need to take that out. It is not okay. This is research of the brain that we know. You know, we know um, that new learning occurs from your prefrontal cortex. I teach the kids your smart brain right here and stress and um, trauma activate your amygdala, which is your lizard brain is what I teach the kids back here, which is your instinctual portion, your fight, flight, freeze, you know, so many staff, so many kids, um, so many admins, are working from their lizard brain or it's being activated constantly throughout the day. And then we're not able to uh, respond to children. We're reacting. And then there's this whole uh, burnout cascade effect that I read about in my research, which is if you have a burnt out teacher, or actually if you ask the children, there was, they asked the children to rate their teacher's social emotional competency, SEC it was called, um, on a scale. And the teachers that scored low where the kids thought they had low social emotional competency had the most behaviors. And there that's, there's such a thing about that, about trust and connection and relationships. So if you have a teacher who's really burnt out, they're not connecting with their kids. Then you have these kids who are like, well, no one's seeing me, so I don't care. And then they're, you know, the behaviors increase and the teacher is more stressed. And then it just becomes an unruly classroom. Mm -hmm. So it's, that's the uh, burnout cascade effect is something they found in the research. So this is, this is a epidemic our education system with teachers leaving the field, not being supported, way too much being asked of them. And then we're like, here, here's a bunch of tools, bring mindfulness, teach kids to breathe. It'll all be better. It's like, right. no, no, that's not working. And so uh, as a mindful mentor myself, I thought it was great. I thought this is all come in. I'll provide the supports you need. I can demonstrate. I can give visuals. I can do these things. And even with that, there was limitations, you know, because, you know, logistics. Well, how many hours are we paying you and who do you get to visit? And just there was so much 
logistics in it that kind of hampered the progress, you know, mm -hmm. that made it difficult. And so I just thought these kids need um, a mindfulness class. You know, we have art class, we have gym class. It's a specialty class, I think, instead of putting it on the teacher's plates, you know, mm -hmm. if that's not working, especially as somebody who's had her own mindfulness practice for over a decade, I know how hard it is. I know how disciplined, you know, you have to be, I know how much work it requires. Um, and if you're surviving throughout the day and then grading papers at night, um, no fault to the teachers, but it's really hard to establish a good mindfulness practice so that you then can teach it to kids. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of my, my issues with, you know, yeah. how we're going about bringing it. Yeah. It's, there's just so much there, Liz, my head was like popping like <laughs> popcorn. Like there's, there's so much bad news and I'm looking forward to us discussing also the yeah. other side of it, but, you know, I've been reading books like the stolen focus, like what was the focus and intention in terms of screens and coddling of the American mind. We talk about this political decisiveness that I really didn't understand to the depth here in the United States in the colleges. Right. And now I'm reading the anxious generation I'm going to a talk tonight about it, you know, and then um, another one I'm reading is uh, love your enemies also about the de decisiveness, the culture of contempt. Like there's so much, Never mind just in society, never mind in schools, you know? And so you pile all that on. And as you say, teachers are at the forefront. They're in the trenches, just barely surviving, you know, drowning. Gen you know, generally speaking, we hear that all the time in our community, people drowning. However, being critiqued. Right, you, sorry. And then being critiqued. And then being critiqued. Yeah. Right. And so you and I, our job here is to to be their advocates to to be their um strength right to have these discussions about now what can we do you know the what, how we met was a discussion about the fork in the road so we understand okay looking at your research you dove deep here's all the sort of here's the reality now what else can we do so talk to us about what are you thinking are sort of like your top tips of how to create a mindfulness program in a school that you're getting buy-in from the students, from the teachers, from the administration, and something's going to last, not like a here, do this, you know, for five minutes on a Friday, right? right. But how do you make it a part of the school culture, for example? Right. I think buy-in is like you said, the most important in my experience too, you know, um, and in the research there's also resistance, you know, I mean, that's part of the research. It was like the people who implemented it. Yeah, it's great. But those are people who volunteered for it because that's what they're interested in. But there were many teachers who did not want to introduce mindfulness into their classroom. They just want to stick to the basics. They did not feel like they were therapists or counselors and wanted to, you know, and I understand that. And I respect that because that's, forcing mindfulness is like the opposite of mindfulness. That's just, you can't do that. So it can't come from people who aren't comfortable doing it. Um, I think buy-in as far as trainings, obviously let's keep training the staff so they can understand children's nervous systems and what, how self-regulation works. And we can stop scolding them for um, not being able to sit still or for lashing out and understand, you know, they talk about the old iceberg analogy, the behavior is the tip, but all these layers are underneath, you know, we need to keep educating um, our, our teachers on all that. And then we need to bring in professionals. Um, mm -hmm. I really, really wholehearted believe you can't teach mindfulness unless you have a mindfulness practice yourself. Um, sure, you can do a little breath before you do a story, but you you can't really get to the level of what mindfulness-based interventions are talking about unless you're doing deep work yourself. So you need to bring in the professionals. I think, um, like I said, having a class, a mindfulness class that kids can go to, they go to art and 
gym twice a week, let's throw in mindfulness. And that way the kids are learning it from somebody who's that's their sole focus. And then those professionals or other professionals can come in too to support the teachers, then mm -hmm. the teachers that want to bring it in and utilize it more because that's the tricky thing. We always say with mindfulness, you can't teach a kid to take a breath in the middle of a meltdown. You have yeah. to them in a calm state, but that's so hard for people to get their head around. Like you can say it, but I've seen it. So many like, just remember to take a breath. It's like, if it's not in their muscle memory yet, get it off the table. It's not going to work. Um, because we're in our lizard brain. We're not in our new learning prefrontal cortex, you know? Um, so you need, so they need to learn it from a professional separate in class. And then I think you need professionals supporting school staff, you know, helping with trainings, helping, you know, well, this isn't working or I have a kid that, you know, um, I have people who are, you know, cause we try to, I like to always <clears throat> empower kids. So at the end of my circle, I always get, pick a kid to do the breathing ball and I'll have a teacher say, well, they go like, <sighs> you know, and then they want to scold them and take it away. And I, you know, so just training on that, like a resp good response would be, wow, that's really fast breathing. When could we use that breathing? You know? Oh, kids answer when we're running. Yes. When you're running outside, that's a good time, but let's try it. You know, we're not running outside, you know, and so to correct in a way that's not shaming or belittling, um, it's a really hard thing to do if you don't have experience and the language first. So that's why I'm like, mindfulness is it's a long practice that takes time. So, um, separate class, uh, professionals to support staff. And then we really need to educate the community and the mm -hmm. parents, I think is the other part so that we can get the politics off of SEL is not a political word. It is the new research that we know of the brain and the body and how it works um, so that we can get kids in their learning thinking brain so they can learn new things. And if they're not, how we can support them you know, um, yeah, but we got to, we got to educate the public so they, we can get off and away from this divisiveness over the topic. Right. Oh my gosh. I love this. So give us an example. It's like, what are some mindfulness activities you're talking about like the how, right? So what mm -hmm. would be something if you're walking into a classroom, you talked about, you know, the breathing, um, the Hoberman sphere, what other kinds of things do you use as your kind of like mindfulness activity toolkit? Yeah. So we use, uh, breathing techniques. I teach them a lot of different breaths. You know, the kids love the wood chopper. We're chopping wood. That's a really good one. Um, to get those big feelings out volcano breath, roller coaster breath. So a lot of breath work. And then I always say I'm not a yoga instructor, but I use yoga based movements. And those are just great because we're moving the body. Cause we all know kids sit way too much in school. So we're moving the body and um, um, using left and right side of our brain, you know, and activating things. And it helps get you in your prefrontal cortex. So yoga based movements. Um, I like doing using art. Um, we I do early childhood. So we do a lot of dancing. You know, I know you work with Kira Wiley and I love her music because she does such great songs that we get to talk about our emotions um, journaling. And then I always, um, in my classes and my time with a relaxation, which you wouldn't believe three-year-olds can sit for a three to five minute meditation, but these kiddos I've worked with for three years, they sure do, you know, mm -hmm. um, guided meditation, um, you know, progressive relaxation where we squeeze and relax our muscles and we get to a place where, and I work with part of the class at a time. So we got the other class, half of the class getting boots and snow pants on to go outside. And, and I've got my little corner of the kids doing a relaxation. So they overcome a lot and, you know, they're mm -hmm. very capable, but I think relaxation is one of my favorite tools, just because I think for me, it's like a challenge that I think so many people shy away from it. They think we just have to keep young kids so busy and movement and all the time. Yeah. And really, um, we 
I'm a big fan of relaxation and um, meditations because it helps activate the creative part of our brain, which I think so much of our culture has gotten away from with um, screen time. Everything is always, you know, if you're bored, um, you just have something to entertain you. You know, I remember when I was little, I had to sit at my great grandma's house and I used to find it so boring and I would just like match the doilies up and like have a universe <laughs> in my mind because that's how I kept myself entertained and we just don't do that anymore and right. that's a big that creative imagination piece is lacking so the that's to me why I always incorporate the relaxation and doing you know like a guided um visual or something where they're using their imagination yeah I want to highlight too so what you're describing is is not hard, right? No. It's simple, but maybe not easy, but you're talking about breathing practices and movement and some mindfulness, fun activities, some art. Okay. So let's remember these, none of these activities are hard and you're probably already doing them anyway. Most teachers, I think what, what I want to highlight with you, Liz, is how you be about it. It's going back to what you're talking about is just as important on how the teacher views all of this work, that yeah. they have their own practices right? That they're coming from their own enthusiasm. So you are telling a story about how mindfulness has been a part of your life for 10 years. So that's where you're going. That's where you're driving from, right? right. When we talk about this again in our school yoga program is go with what you already feel comfortable with. Yes. Right? Yes. Go with what you feel comfortable with. So if you're someone who is you know, who has done a breath practice or sit down with meditation every day or loves the going to the gym and practicing yoga there or going to a studio, whatever it is for you, whatever health, you know, health and wellness, uh, spiritual practice that you're already doing, do more of that and the children will come through. So for you to create that magic with three-year-olds, like most of us would think, think, oh my gosh, there's no way <laughs> I would have a group of three-year-olds in the corning in Shavasana in a resting pose. Like there's no way, right? But you yeah. just do it because that's who you be. You're yes. like, yeah, this is what we do, right? Yeah. And they can yeah. feel that confidence, right? In you yeah. and, and how you are. And you're not gonna just, you know, try it once and it's not gonna work and never do it again. No, you oh, seem to be the kind no. of person that you're gonna show up week after week after week, they probably have like a name for you, like mindfulness mama or something, you know, like yes. they know this is the time, <laughs> right? This is the time that they're with you and they know this is what you do. Like you're setting up expectations. I mean, you, again, you're saying it like, it's so easy, but you've set, you've come in those classes, you've set expectations. They know who you are. They know they get the confidence from you. They feel connected. They feel seen. You know, there's a lot of things that are social emotional and learning in the way that you've created the class never mind the actual activities yeah right yeah I forgot to add in that always a check-in with our feelings too every single time yeah. and it can it's time consuming but it's so important to me and I'm not saying every teacher has to do that but some sort of check-in some sort of connection we all say our name we check in with our heart. How are we feeling? We check in with our bodies. What sensations do you notice every single time? And in the beginning, they say, good, good, good. Yeah. And, you know, now these kiddos that I've been working with the last three years are like, well, you know, my heart really misses my mom today because she's not picking me up after school. And my tummy is really hungry and my skin is itchy. And it's like, oh, my gosh, I don't know adults that are that in tune. But because we do right every week and then they just get used to checking in so yeah I forgot to mention that one is so important to me but connection is is the key however you connect getting on their level making an eye contact mm -hmm. connect make them feel seen you right. know and what you're creating there then they're more able to learn they're ready to learn after Yes. Right. So you set yeah. them up for success afterwards. It's not like they're arriving to school, these little toddlers, and it's like a fire hose of academics, you know, right. or right, or or demands, or like have to sit or this, or you know, no, you're you're creating a space where they can be. They yeah, can be and I think it's be. really important to hold a container to have 
a boundary. You know, I have a little, the Medi Teddy, if you've seen him, the little yoga bear, and he sh reminds us how to sit. Cause when we do check in, it can be long and some of them get squirmy, but we, you know, I remind them that they're teaching or they're listening to their, to their friends and we want to show respect. So I have a very, for check-in, my rules kind of rigid and the rest of it, it's pretty open and free. Then we can, you know, if you want to do a different yoga pose, it's fine. If you want to lay on your belly, if I'm reading a story, that's fine, you know, but for check-in, we're always really present. We're looking at our friend. We're not making noise because that's what being a good friend is. So I hold a container. Yeah. And then yeah. kind of double-edged sword there is also to let go of expectations, you know, hold right. a good container, have good boundaries, but don't force, don't make it, hmm. you know, I've had teachers come over and be like, she's doing downward dog, you know, follow her. And I'm like, if they want to do yeah, know, right. cat cow, it's fine. They're listening to their hmm. body. So not yeah. rigid in do what I'm doing you know, have a good container as far as boundaries and being respectful and a good friend. But then, you know, it's some of them, you know, sit and watch for a few weeks before they even participate ever. Mm -hmm. So, you mm -hmm. know, some of it's just observation and that's okay. That's mindfulness too. So it all looks awesome. different. I love it. So tell us a story, Liz, you've got to have a story of, of one of your kiddos, maybe was having some kind of issue or something you kind of overcame just so you can dive into your world. Yeah. Oh, a few. I, one of my favorites, actually this, I'll still get choked up talking about it. This was about a year ago with this, um, school I've been working with for three years. So I had had these kids pretty regularly and we were sitting down for check-in. We always start with our check-in and, uh, I had one new girl and she was kind of watching everybody, you know, they're like saying they're deep, you know, I'm, you know, I miss my grandma, whatever, blah, blah, blah. And then I get to the new girl and I said, how are you feeling? How does your body feel? And she said, good, good. And then she said, well, actually, I think I have something to tell you. And I said, oh, okay. And she said, I'm kind of sad. And I said, well, why are you sad? And she said, because my uncle just died. Mm. said oh I'm so sorry and the friend next to her four years old autistic put his hand on her back mm. and just held it there mm. and we just had a moment and her eyes welled up with tears and I said I am so sorry is there anything I can do um, you know, I know when I'm sad, I like a hug. And so I gave her a hug and then we continued on. And it's typical with most, um, four-year-olds, they're very monkey see monkey do. Then it was, it was, well, my grandma died, you know, and this and that. And, you know, another kid shared that her grandma died before she was born, but she knows that she comes and visits her at night and Aww. just, all, you know, somebody shared that their dog died and it was just this really beautiful space for spontaneous grief that those kids got to process that day. And it didn't take any longer than our normal check-in, but I'll tell you what, the uh, more hands went on more backs. I was just like, oh, you guys, I had to cry when I left because it was just yeah. so beautiful. And I yeah. thought, this is why I'm doing this. This is, yeah. this is what I'm teaching, how to be in community, how to create space. You know, I think a lot of times people get uncomfortable, um, which is why I think professionals are important too. They get uncomfortable with the not good feelings. You know, um, if someone says sad, they're like, oh, well you should be happy. And it's like, no, it's okay to be sad. And it's okay to lean into that. We don't have to stay there for the whole day. We just leaned into it, into our circle that morning. And then we had a fun, you know, rompous uh, dance party later on, you know? So yeah, yeah. it was just, it. that is probably one of the moments that I cherish. Cause I, that was when I realized, okay, I'm doing the right thing. And this is why I'm doing it. Yeah. And in that moment, Liz, 
nothing else mattered, right? Yeah. It, none of the, the issues that we're facing today, all these things we yeah. talked about earlier, none of that mattered. Yeah. What mattered was the life of this child, right? And, and all that those kids. is why we come back time and time again as teachers. And so it's about doing whatever you need to do. In your case, you took a break or, you know, taking um, health classes or whatever, like whatever it is that you need to do to get yourself balanced and centered and connect with your children at a deeper level. The curriculum, the parents, the admin, all these other demands, they will always be there for us, but it's up to us to take charge yeah. of our minutes that we have with these children. Yeah. Four years old. I mean, that's incredible. And you've planted a seed for life. Yeah. Right. That's what I'm Who hoping. knows that that might change the trajectory of that child's life or the, yeah. the children in that class. Right. I love that. So what advice do you have, you know, for schools who, who, like you said, we know the importance, but they don't know how to implement it in a way that, yeah, that doesn't put more on teacher's plate. It doesn't cost heaps more money. It's not more and more and more. How, how, what advice do you have? Where do we start? I think it's just really allowing more room and it's hard in the schools because there's so many rules and, you know, you have so many hours, but I think we just need to get back to allowing people to, I was really uh, fortunate when I started out to have a wonderful boss who just, you know, when I was doing the nature center, she was so nurturing and encouraging my ideas. And I got to build a great nature center from that because she supported me. So I think really, uh, don't mandate it. You know, I know there was like for a while there, we were mandating, you know, calming corners in your room. And it's like, it's a great intention, but you can't force mindfulness. So we got to take away the, mm mandations and just allow people to discover it, you know, provide the trainings, keep working it, and then allow the people that are picking it up to run with it. You know, that's why I feel so grateful because I was an assistant and I got to go and be certified in yoga calm and become a mindful mentor. You know, um, I wasn't a lead teacher. And so you need to allow the people that um, are interested to run with it and, you know, and yeah, I think just creating a space for that environment without I that. force. I think that's really great, actually, Liz. Like that, it, it seems so obvious once you say it, right? That in in a school, right? There, everyone, all the teachers, educators, support staff, all of us are going to have different passions. Yeah. So allow some space to lean in to what people are good at. Look at our strengths. Look at the potpourri, right? The yeah of all the different strengths and interests. And if you have somebody puts their hand up, you know, yoga and mindfulness, yes, get the the P PTO or PTA, P P Parent Teacher Association. And, and I know there's a school near us where the middle school uh, health teacher, she got a grant to do her yoga teacher training like that, right? Like yes. exactly what you said, let someone stand up in your community and say, Hey, I'm, I'm up for this. Let me go off and do my training and see if I can, what I can do to implement it. We don't yeah. have to all know all the things all the no, time. No. Right? So how do we find you online and uh, what's next for you? Well, I am, I am just leading with my heart and looking for the doors. Um, you can follow me. I'm mindfulness with miss Liz either mindfulness with Miss .com is my website um, where you can find my links to Facebook or Instagram, but those are both mindfulness with Miss Liz. Um, yeah, that's where you can find me. And I'm just finishing up my degree and uh, going into holistic health now. So I'm, I'm seeing where that's taking me, but I'm still bringing my work to kids. And so when the opportunities arise, I'm, I'm here, I'm ready. I love it. Thank you so much for sharing so generously and passionately and, and for sharing your research as well. We so, so appreciate you. Keep on keeping on whatever you do, Liz. It's a miracle. Yeah. Thank, thank you. you for giving me space to talk about it, Giselle. I appreciate it. Thanks, Liz. Bye.